Well, good morning. That works. It's really loud. See, that's why we don't turn on when we sing. That would be torture. I learned that a long time ago. Well, thanks for your nice introduction, Bill. We, uh, you know, this, this, it's, it was so much fun serving with, um, with Bill and Steve. Um, yeah, I could tell you a lot of stories. I won't. I'll tell you one story, I guess. I remember Bill and I, Bill said, we traveled all over the place together. And when you would arrive um, at these places after a long flight, they would have a baggage line. And so everybody gets in row and they pass the bags out. And that's how you empty the plane really quick. And, um, and there was this bag that was so heavy. You know, I said, man, this guy's got really a lot of stuff. It was twice as heavy as every bag. You know, and then I passed it on, you know, to Bill, and you know, he didn't say anything. I found out later it's his bag. So every trip we took, I'm always dreading to see that bag. I don't know, Bill, you didn't need to bring your dumbbells with you, you know, on these. So, but, uh, and Steve was so much fun, too. I don't know, do you guys still call him Macaroni Man? Um, he was a lot of fun, too. Well, if you have your Bibles, uh, turn with me to Ecclesiastes. I printed up some notes, but I don't think they got to you guys today, so, so you can just kind of follow along. But we're going to be in Ecclesiastes, and, uh, and it's an interesting little book. And it starts off in chapter 1, and it says, The words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. Vanity of vanity, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. And uh, I know I have a clicker here somewhere. And, uh, and so, so what a way to start a book. Vanity of vanities, everything is vanity. Now you may, I want to make sure you understand that I'm reading from the ESV, but vanity, there's, it's, two, it's a word that's spelled the same that has two different meanings. Vanity, um, to some people, is pride. So a long time ago, women would sit at their beautiful vanities and they'd put their makeup on and, and so it got connected with a sense of pride. But there's another word of vanity that means uh, we comes from vain. Uh, for example, like when my wife goes and works in her garden and pulls weeds for two hours, and next week it's like she didn't do a thing. She would say she did that all in vain. That's what this word means. It's meaningless. It's in vain. But what a way to start a book. I mean, it sounds so depressing, doesn't it? So, you know, there's some interesting uh, ways to start books. Um, uh, it was the best of times. It was the worst of times. Right? That's from Dickens, A Tale of Two Cities. That's the book you want to read. Oh, really? What was the best? What was the worst? All right? All children except one grow up. That's Peter Pan. That's a book. Oh, Willie, who's this one kid that didn't grow up? You want to read this? Find out, right? Uh, where's Papa going with the axe? That's Charlotte's Web. Yeah, it's not, a, not a, one of those slasher ones, but it's <laughs> Charlotte's Web. But still, you want to find out where did Papa go? All right? Call me Ishmael. That's uh, Moby Dick, right? And I like this one. There was a boy called Eustace Clarence Scrub, and he almost deserved it. That was from, um, that's from C.S. Lewis' Voyage of the Dawn Treader. But, but here, he starts off this book by saying, meaningless, vanity, meaningless. Everything is vanity. All is vanity. And I'm thinking, is this a book I want to read? <laughs> Especially if I'm already a bit depressed. Well, we're going to take a look at that book today and open up the pages and kind of survey through the book and see exactly what he is referring to that, that so closely connects with many of our lives that it actually sounds like a modern book that could have been written yesterday. Let's open in a word of prayer. Our gracious Father, we thank you for the opportunity to worship you today as we did so, so wonderfully in these songs that we sang. Lord, you are worthy. And Lord, we praise you for being such a great, amazing, and loving God loving us so much to have created us with purpose and meaning, made us valuable because of the love and, and the purpose that you've given in our lives. But Lord, your love just doesn't extend just to that. You love all of us. You love the whole world. And Jesus Christ was sent into this world to display the love in a very unique and special way by giving his life for the sinners on this planet. So Lord, we praise you for that. But as we look at this book today, Lord, we pray that you would speak to us. Help us to understand what is it about our lives that can somehow just seem to be so meaningless when you love us so much. Give us insight as we, as we leave here today to how 
uh, we can better glorify you with our lives. What needs to change that we can be more like our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ? And so to that end, we commit this time to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, so if you have your book, I want to talk a little bit about it, um, Ecclesiastes. And um, I, I, I thought I did. Well, let's try now. Nope, still nothing. Oh, they, did Bill do it? Did you do it? Oh, okay. Oh, there's a button on the side. Okay, that, that solves that problem. If that's the only problem we have today, then we'll be okay. Well, Ecclesiastes. So Solomon wrote three books. He wrote Song of Solomon when he was really young and he was in love. It's a wonderful book to read. You can see how women are compared to, to goats on a hill. <laughs> Things like that. It's really a great book, though. Uh, and, then, and then he wrote, as he got mature and got older in life, he wrote a book called Proverbs because he had been gaining wisdom. And you remember, he asked God for wisdom, so he had a lot to share. So Proverbs, these uh, little sayings of, of wisdom and what you need to do to live well. 31 chapters, one for each day of the month. Great book to go through. But he's getting old now. It's late in his life. And he's done magnificent things. And he wrote a book called Ecclesiastes. And at the end of his life, this is him reflecting on his life. And, um, and we read it, and we're really not that impressed. Yeah, it's, it's a depressing book. The word happy actually occurs more than any other book in the New Testament. It occurs four times in this depressing book. But the key word is under the sun. Now, under the sun occurs 28 times, and that is the theme of the book. And you've got to keep that in mind when you read it, because everything he's going to talk about is under the sun. Well, what is under the sun? Life on earth. What theologians call the human predicament. It's our life here. And so it is a book. When you look at the meaning and the purpose of life and everything that we do here, when it seems to have no meaning, no purpose, no value... So the other thing that people don't like about the book is it has what they call a um, cyclical teaching style. So it seems to be disordered in our Western minds, but in the Eastern minds, it revisits the same subject time and time again, perhaps in a different way and sometimes in the same way. And so it seems to be redundant. Why didn't he talk about this here? And we'll see that when we go through because we'll be looking at a couple different places at the same time. And so it's kind of confusing. It doesn't seem to be very ordered. And then finally, the biggest thing is that you need to understand is the kind of literature that it is. It's, it's called um, reflective literature. So you have the Psalms who are responding to God. So when you read the, the Psalms, it's people who are, who are responding to what God has blessed them with, the circumstances, they're asking God for things. Right? But then you have the prophets, and they're declaring from God truth. And we get those two pretty well. We speak to God, we praise God, we worship God. God speaks to us through his word, through his prophets. But this is reflective literature, and it's for people to talk to people. So here's what I've learned, here's what I've learned, here's what I've learned, here's what I've learned. And so it's reflective, and it goes back and forth. And, and these are the sages. And so we don't deal so much with that. Uh, if you were living in Greece, the time of, of Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, those folks, you would have a different understanding of the sharing of wisdom. And so it's a different kind of literature in that way too. There's a book that I really like by Dan Allender. And just to give you a, just this survey of, the, of Ecclesiastes, here's what he says. He says there are seven key messages to this book. Now, just I know this is going to be like going to the dentist, Okay, but stick with it, okay? Trust me. He says, control will always slip from our grasp. Relationships will always disappoint. Work will leave us frustrated. Pleasure never lasts. Wisdom is never an adequate guide. Spirituality usually gives in to legalism. And life, at the end, <laughs> ends in decay and death. Yeah, let's get a tooth pulled rather than having to read this, right? This sounds so depressing, Right? And so that's Allender's message. And, uh, and so what is the, the main focus of the book, the, this main message? The main message is 
you know, you can't be happy. You can't stay happy because life is meaningless. Now, it's life under the sun. And that's what we're going to see and that's what we're going to talk about. That sounds just terrible. But it's like it's written by a modern-day existentialist as we read this through. So, let's talk a little bit about happiness. Right? I think it's interesting that the Constitution says that we can be happy. It says you have the right to pursue happiness. I, I think it's interesting it doesn't promise us that we can. You, you have the right to stay happy. It's like the writers of the Constitution knew that that's not going to happen. Happiness is so fleeting. So if you go online and look at life coaches, and, um, and if you talk to various therapists, um, there's books written called Be Happy Now and things like that. And they'll always ask you, okay, what would it take in your life for you to be happy? And, and then you need to develop this list. Well, I need, to, I need to accomplish some goals in my life, right? So they have goals on there. And they come through these lists of things that will make you happy. And then they set out a life coach to kind of develop this system by which you can set some intermediate goals and you can make some accomplishments and start on your way to happiness, right? And so, but it doesn't last. And so we're going to need to revisit that life coach. After we've attained all those goals, do we really think that now we're going to be happy and it's going to, it's going to last? So what I want to do is I want to go through the book of Ecclesiastes with you and, uh, and look at some of the things that Solomon says about his happiness. Well, so he starts off, and, um, and there's, there's about a dozen of these altogether. And he says, I'll be happy when I get all my physical desires fulfilled. So turn with me to Ecclesiastes chapter 1. Uh, I'm sorry, chapter 2. And, um, and I'm going to read through the first 11 verses. And um, you can follow along. It says, I said in my heart, come now, I will test you with pleasure. Enjoy yourself. But behold, this also was vanity. I said of laughter, it is mad. And of pleasure, what use is it? I searched my heart to know how to cheer my body with wine, my heart still guiding me with wisdom, and how to lay hold of folly till I might see what is good for all the children of man to do under the sun during the few days of, his, of their lives. I made great works. I built houses. I planted vineyards for myself. I made myself gardens and parks. I planted in them all kinds of fruit trees. I made myself pools from which to water the forest, the, the growing trees. I bought male and female slaves and had slaves who were born in my house. I also had great possessions of herds and flocks, more than anyone who had ever been before me in Jerusalem. I also gathered for myself silver and gold and the treasures of kings and provinces. I got singers, both men and women, and, and many concubines. Remember how many wives and concubines? Set, what, 700 wives and 300 concubines? Right, the delights of the children of man. So I became great. I surpassed all who were before me in Jerusalem. Also, my wisdom remained with me. Whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. That's a dangerous statement. I kept my heart from no pleasure, for my heart was found, for, for my heart found pleasure in all my toil, and this was my reward for all my toil. Then I considered all that my hands had done, and the toil that had, ex, had expended in doing it. And behold, all was vanity, striving after wind, and there was nothing to be gained under the sun. Some people will say, I'll be happy when. Now you've said that, I've said that. I'll be happy when. We make these statements and, and fill in a blank. You, you probably did that this last week. Boy, I'll be happy when. Gas goes back down to whatever. I'll be happy when, right? We say this all the time. So Solomon is breaking this down through his book. And he's saying, look, I'll be happy when I can pursue pleasure. Now, for some of you, maybe that's, um, maybe that's going camping, horseback riding, fishing, Maybe for some of you, it's travel. Maybe for some of you, I'll be happy when I can see my grandkids again. Maybe for some of you, I'll be happy when I can see that next Avengers Infinity movie. You know, I'll be happy when that new song by whoever comes out. I don't know any of these new people, right? I'll be happy when I can see this concert, when I can go to this movie. I can... Now, I'm not telling you that those things are wrong. 
What I'm suggesting to you is if you think that those things will produce happiness in your life, you're mistaken. It's not wrong to participate in these things. But if you think that is the means to happiness, then you've got a ticket to the wrong Christianity show here. It's not, we're not going to the same place because God's going to talk about that. Those kinds of things are a life that in, you enjoy the things that God has blessed us with and I think he wants us to. But it's not the process to happiness. It's more the product of happiness. Because I'm happiness, I can enjoy these things. Not that these things will make me happy. So you have a long list that we just read. And, and you notice there's a lot of things in there. Wine. Boy, if I can just get to the weekend, and, and, and because that's what Michelob was made for. <laughs> right? We, we have, we have de- chemical dependency. We have a lot of things that we live for. Even as Christians that are connected directly with the things of this world that produce happiness. But it won't last. Little Tolstoy. He was a, uh, a Russian novelist. And he wrote, uh, you probably know him from his books, War and Peace. Nobody ever gets through that. Uh, and um, Anna Karenina, Karenina, he wrote that book as well. Um, famous author. And in 1854, he went through a crisis. He was going through a personal crisis in his life. And so he, um, oddly, a friend of his encouraged, well, have you read the Bible? He says, well, you know, piece, bits and pieces of it. And he says, well, read it. Why don't you start at the Gospels? And so he was reading through the Beatitudes. He was reading through the Gospel of Matthew. And he became a Christian. And he wrote, um, just a couple of years later, he wrote a book, it's kind of semi-autobiographical, called uh, The Confessions. And in it, he tells a story. He says, picture a traveler who's running, walking through the desert. There's no place to go. There's nothing around him, but he's walking through the desert. He looks behind him, and and there's a lion coming right behind him, stalking him. And so he picks up the pace. He's hoping to find some place to hide, and he sees an old well. And, and there's kind of a little bit of an oasis there. So he, he jumps in the well. To, and the lion is getting close. He jumps in the well. And there's a lot of sticks along the sides of the well. And, and he's kind of working his way down. And all of a sudden, he hears something below. And he looks below. And Tolstoy says he sees a ferocious dragon at the bottom of this well, probably a cave. And this dragon lived in it. So the guy is looking up. There's a lion looking over the edge. He looks, he looks down, and, and, and then he sees the dragon down there. And so he, he's grabbing these branches, and he notices something else. That there's a white, some of you may have read this, you're laughing. There's a white and a black mouse running around the branches he's on. And they're chewing away the branches. And he's like, oh, what am I going to do? And then he sees something that surprised him. There were leaves. As his eyes began to adjust, he saw leaves on the sides of, this, of this, this cave, this well. And he looked closely, and there was some, looked like some kind of shiny liquid on it. And he was thirsty. So he licked, stuck out his tongue as he was hanging on, and he licked it, and it was honey. He says, oh, what joy. And so he looks around, and there's a whole bunch of leaves. And he sees more honey coming out, flowing down, and he starts licking. And he thinks, oh, this isn't so bad. And he's licking, and he's just, and then all of a sudden he drank it, he's waiting for the next honey to come along. And then he sees another one that's just dropping honey. All the while, oblivious, now all of a sudden, distracted by this honey, he's oblivious to the dragon and the lion and the mice. The white and black mouse represent the days of our lives, according to Tolstoy. And this is, this is how I felt, he said. I felt like nothing I had done was meaningful. The days of my life were going in and death was hanging over my head, but nothing I had accomplished had any value. Yeah, Tolstoy had a, had a, was rich. He had everything, just like Solomon. But you see, pleasure, cannot, we cannot find fulfillment. We cannot find happiness. So I'll be happy when I get to fill in a blank. And I will guarantee it won't happen. You may be happy for a little bit, but it's very fleeting. So we're always living to the next thing. He says, I'll be happy with my hard work pays off. Well, we kind of talked a little bit about that in chapter 2, verse 11. But, but glance with me at 2.22. And, um, and he says in 2.22 and 23, he says, What has a man from all the toil and striving of, of heart with which he toils beneath the sun? For all his days are full of sorrow and his work is vexation. 
it's just, it doesn't last. It doesn't last. You work hard, it just doesn't last. I'll be happy when I get this project done. No, you won't. You'll be happy for momentarily, and then you'll be looking for the next project. Because all the toil and the things we do, it won't last. How about wisdom? Boy, so many people go to college, they invest in, in reading and studying, and man, I spent way too many years in school. And, and to what end? Yeah, if I get really smart, if I get that college degree, if I get this and get that. Well, he talks about that in chapter 2, verse uh, 12 and 14. He says, so I turn myself to wisdom and madness and folly. For what can a man who, uh, for what can the man do who comes after the king? Only what he has already been done. Then I saw that there is no more gain in wisdom than in folly. There's no more gain in light than in darkness. The wise person has his eyes on his head, but the fool walks in darkness and and yet, I perceive that the same event happens to all of them. It doesn't matter. You're still going to have problems in life. You're still part of the human predicament, no matter how smart you are. I'll be happy when I get that degree, when I get out of school. No, it won't solve your problems, and the happiness will not abide. And he goes on, and he says, well, I'll be happy when I leave my family well off. Now, you hear people talk about this when they get older in life. Well, I'm, I'm really living for my kids, for an inheritance. I saw a, a bumper sticker on a big um, RV going down a road. It says, using all of our kids' inheritance up. <laughs> and they called retirement, using all of our kids' inheritance up. But some people really want to live, leave their, their kids off better. My father used to say that. He says, well, as long as I can leave my kids off better than I was, I'll know that I was successful, at least in that. And he used to say things like that. He died two years ago. And, uh, but that's really not, that's not really going to produce happiness. He says something really interesting in verse 18 of chapter 2. He says, um, let me find it. So, um, or did, what I said, is that the right, uh, 21. No, that's the wrong verse. Uh, we'll get to that one. But he says, so you leave it to somebody else and, and they don't even appreciate it. They don't care about it. And it becomes meaningless to them. They don't remember who gave it to them. And he goes on, he talks about that, but I put the wrong verse down. Sorry about that. So then he goes on, he says, I'll be happy when I'm living the dream. When I'm living my dreams. I used to hear this in the military all the time on deployments. I'd walk up to people. I remember um, I, would, I would go out to the flight line at night and take coffee and stuff to people. I said, how you doing? He says, they say, I'm living the dream. You know, if you've been in the Air Force or military, you heard that. Living the dream, right? And uh, I always thought, what a cliche, Living the dream. You're working in a terrible place in the middle of the night. I know you'd rather be home with your family. Is this really the dream? Are you really living it? You know, maybe. I mean, it's good that they're there and everything. But that's a tough pill to swallow. But some people think, man, I just need to establish these goals and these dreams. I fulfill my dreams, I'll be happy. The dreams will never be fulfilled because they, are, they will only last until the next thing comes along. You'll, you'll discover an endless hole. And so... People come up with goals and dreams for their life and thinking that will produce happiness, but it won't. And, and he says that in chapter 5, and we'll take a look at that one, verse 7. He says, uh, he says, For when dreams increase and words grow many, there is vanity. So, um, but God is the one you must fear. So when, when words increase, you know, people always talking about their dreams, always talking about where, that's what he's saying. They, they, they always talk about the things they're going to do, but they never seem to accomplish it. And so the dreams become just this faded, misty notion. And, and so, but even if they could accomplish it, they're not going to be happy. Well, he goes on, a few more of these as we go through. Um, I'll be happy when I'm rich. I don't know how many people play the lottery thinking, man, if I could just hit those six numbers or whatever, solve my life's problems. Well, it doesn't work that way. There's support groups and 12-step programs for lottery winners. <laughs> the owner of the uh, Dallas Mavericks, I forget his name, Cuban, Mark Cuban, I think it is, they interviewed him because a lottery was like billion, a billion dollars, you know. And so they interviewed him. What would you suggest to people? And he said, the first thing he said is, if you're happy now, you'll still be happy when you win the money. But if you're not happy now, you won't be happy after you win the money. Money does not produce happiness. It'll solve problems, because you can solve problems with money. And if that's happiness to you, solving your problems, well, then maybe you'll be a little bit happier. But he talked about that. See, money doesn't produce happiness. 
And, and so people think, well, I get rich. Well, Solomon had it made. He was rich, richer than anybody else, he says. Um, but you know what? It didn't matter. It, it just did not matter. 5 and 10, chapter 5, verse uh, 10. He who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves wealth with his income. It's interesting that whenever you, when, when, when we would get raises, as, as, as we got, after we got married and time would go by, we'd get raises, many would get raises, whatever. But our income, uh, our expenses always kind of matched our income. I, I don't understand how that worked, but we, we never, we just kind of, everything kind of went up. You know, and they call it the cost of living. So if they give you a raise, it's just so you can keep up, right? That's really what that is. But if you think that this next raise or getting wealthy and getting rich and all these things, it's not going to work. Uh, he who loves money will not be satisfied. So are you striving for money in your life? It's not going to work. And he goes on and he says, um, some people, boy, if they just had a big family and lots of kids. The thinking, I think, is, you know, there's so much joy in family life and there's so much, um, you know, relationships and and things that, that, that's where the meaning of life is found. Well, not according to Solomon. In verse 3, says, If a man fathers a hundred children and lives many years, so that the days of his life are many, but, toils, but, but his soul is not satisfied with life good things, he also has uh, no burial. I say a stillborn child is better off than he. Just because you have a lot of people in your life or a big family, it may be a point of more contention doesn't necessarily mean you'll be happy. And so, um, so man, we're just running out of things to, to, to get happiness from. I mean, what, what else is left? How about justice? Mm, this is one I would hear a lot. People would say, I'll be happy when I finally get vindication from this terrible thing that these people, this guy did to me. I want, I'm not going to let this go. I'm going to hold on to this until I get justice. And, and as if holding on to something in the past is going to bring justice. It's an odd way of thinking. But no, he talks about this in chapter 8, verse 14. And he says that there's just no justice in the land. Specifically, he says, there is a vanity that takes place on the earth, that there are righteous people to whom it happens according to the deeds of the wicked, and there are wicked people to whom it happens according to the deeds of the righteous. And I said, this too is vanity. Every, the same things happen to those who, have, who, who are, are righteous as those who aren't. In other words, evil people can prosper. And so if you're living for justice, I'll be happy when I get vindication, when I get justice. No, no you won't, because you may never see it. Well, he goes on and he says one more, and there's, there's a lot more, but I'm just I'm kind of cherry-pick these out. I'll be happy when I'm remembered for the great things that I did. Chapter 9. This is an interesting little parable. It's the only parable that's uh, found here. In, in, um, it's actually found in verse, uh, chapter 9, verse um, 14, I believe. There is a little city with few men in it, and a great king came against it and besieged it, building great siege works, works against it. But there was found in it a poor wise man, and he, by his wisdom, delivered the city. Now, we're not told, you know, what city it is, who this guy was, what he did. How did he deliver this city? He's poor, but he's wise. We don't, we don't know any of these things. And so... Um, but it says, yet no one remembered that poor man. Yeah, you see that the city kind of came and it went and people moved on and left and they had their lives, but to what end? So he saved the city and they lived another 20, 30, whatever years, but nobody remembered what had happened. There are a lot of great people who have existed throughout the history of the world. And as time goes on, their graves fade. You can barely read the name on the tombstone. And the memory of what they did fades too. And, and, and so our lives have, have meaning, but it's a relative meaning. It is related to the people, the circumstance right now. It may not have, without Christ, an ultimate meaning. And that's what he's saying. That there's no ultimate meaning under the sun. And, and so no matter what things you may accomplish, no, ma no matter what you may be remembered for. How long will you be remembered for it? Solomon did all of this stuff, but he felt like, man, people, people just are not even going to remember me. Mark Twain. Mark Twain said something interesting. This is one of the last things he said. 
and, and, and you get the sense of where his heart was near, when he was near death. He said, um, a myriad of men are born. They labor and sweat and struggle. They, they squabble and, and scold and, and fight. They scramble for a little mean advantage over each other. Age creeps upon them. Infernities follow. Those who love are taken from them, and the joys of life are turned to aching grief. It, the relief, release of this life, comes at last, the only unpoisoned gift the earth ever had for them. And they vanish from the world where they were of no consequence, and the world that will lament for them for a day and then forget them forever. Mark Twain. Mark Twain said that. Well, you look at people who live, who want to live a long time and enjoy life. Solomon has things to say about those folks too. Um, Solomon says that there's a, a, a lot of meaningless to, to long life. Look at chapter 12. If you look at chapter 12, it says, remember your creator, verse 1, in the days before evil come, and, and he says, um, uh, the days of your youth, I have no pleasure in them. Before the sun and the light and the moon and the stars are darkened and the clouds uh, return after the rain, in the day when the keepers of the house... Yeah, so you've lived a long time, you've enjoyed a good life. The keepers of the house. What are the keepers of the house? Probably the legs. Um, they tremble. And strong men are bent. And you're back. You walk like this more than you used to. Oh, this is... I'll be happy when... Right, the, 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 the back is bent over. And uh, the grinders cease because they are few. You're losing your teeth. And we have dentures today, right? That's kind of helpful. But the grinders cease because they're few. You start losing your teeth. Yeah, this is, I'll be happy when I live a life, nice old age. This is what you have to look forward to. <laughs> it says, and those who look out the windows are dimmed. You can't hardly see out the window. It's called cataracts. Or eyesight is failing. Yeah. And, and the doors of the street are shut and the sound... When the sound of grinding is low, your ears, your ears aren't working so good. You can't hear what's going on outside, right? And, um, and one rises at the sound of the bird, and, and so you, get, you can't sleep at night. You rise way early in the morning and wonder, how come I can't sleep anymore, right? And, uh, the, and all the daughters of the songs are brought low. They are afraid also of the high and the, and the, and the terrors along the way. So you kind of hate to go outside. You can't protect yourself like you used to. You know, there's terrors. It's, everything gets scary when you get old. That's the joys of a nice long life. The almond tree blossoms. You get gray hair. That makes sense. The grasshopper drags itself along and desire fails. Um, they have a blue pill for that. <laughs> um, a man is going to his eternal home and the mourners go about the street. Before the silver cord is snapped and the golden bowl is broken or the pitcher is shattered and the fountain, all these things are happening and, and, and so... That's life. That's what Mark Twain was, was talking about. All these terrible things, and I can't do anything about it. That's life. So, now, you felt like you went to the dentist? Okay. Yeah, this was, this was sad, right? All right, but here's the hope. Do not love the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes and the pride of life, is not from the Father, but from the world. Whoever, and, and the world is passing away along with the desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. All of these things are worldly things. They, they cannot produce, they will not produce happiness. When you say, I'll be happy when, and you're thinking of a worldly thing, I want to tell you right now, you won't be happy when, because it will not satisfy because it is a worldly thing. And you, as a believer, are not. So, our problem then. What is our problem here? Our problem is that we are dissatisfied because we lack an understanding of the ultimate meaning of our lives. Our happiness just seems to be connected to people and events and circumstances. And so we are driven by the things in our life rather than living for a bigger purpose transcendent of the things of our lives. That's why Paul could say, man, if I die, I lose it all. If I live, I get to keep it all. No, he didn't say that. He said, for me to live is Christ. To die is gain, right? To live is Christ. He's living for Christ, not himself, not these things. And he'll find true happiness then. We'll talk about that in just a second. 
To live as Christ, to die is gain. How does that work? Well, that's what I want to spend the next few minutes telling you. How does that work? Well, here's our solution, okay? If you, it's found in Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Early on, he makes this statement, and I don't want you to miss it. There's a song, you know, that there's a time for this, a time for I think the birds or whoever used to sing that song, right? Um, a time for love, a time for war. And then, and then in verse 11, he says, He has made everything beautiful in its time. He has put eternity into man's heart, yet so that he cannot understand or find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. What is he saying there? He says, there's a time for all of these things, but you don't even know what it is. Time for war, there's a time for peace, there's a time for laughter, there's a time for crying, there's a time for this, a time for that. But you don't understand the times because you're not God. But God put eternity in our hearts. We live transcendent of time. So, I want you to think about this. There's a logic thing here, all right? If abiding happiness is not found in the things of this world and pursuing the things of this world, we must therefore be made for something else, something greater. That's why Paul could say, for me to live as Christ, to die is gain. I, uh, and so what God has prepared for us will give us an abiding happiness. 1 Corinthians 2.9 Eye has not seen, ear has not heard, mind cannot conceive of the wonderful things God has prepared for those who love him. I've had conversations with people, and, I, and, I, I, and, and we, sometimes we'll talk about heaven. Well, do you think you're going to go to heaven? Well, I don't know. I don't even know if I want to go to heaven, chaplain. Uh, it's boring up there. <laughs> Hell is where the fun happens, right? I don't know if you've ever heard stuff like that, right? And I'm like, what do you, what, why in the world would you think heaven would be boring? If all of the things that we try to find happiness through in this earth will not satisfy us because we're made for something greater, listen closely. Heaven is going to be a blast because finally the things that we want, the things that we're looking for, we found we are eternal people, these temporary things. I don't care how good Batman versus Superman of a movie is. It's not going gonna, gonna to be happy in it. You're not going to find abiding joy and happiness by going and doing these things. You can do them. That's okay. I'm not saying don't do them, right? I'm saying you won't find it there because you're made for something far greater than that. You are an eternal people with a purpose. And God has amazing things planned for you. That will produce happy. You think you're having fun now? Wait till you get to heaven. It's going to be a blast. You can't even begin to imagine, Paul says, how great it's going to be. And so Paul says, to die is gain. That's what he means. But boy, we don't live like that. We just don't. I don't. I'm, I'm sure I'm just like you. You're like me. We, we're so in this world. We're in what the theologians call this human predicament. We're just in this world. And this world seems so real to us. And we just tend to invest in it in ways that maybe we shouldn't. And, and we tend to live in this world far more than we live out the purposes of God. So, so the thing that we, we need is this eternal life. But eternal life itself is not going to satisfy us. We'll talk about that in a second. But we have eternal life. We have no fear of death. Tolstoy, he didn't fear death anymore. He didn't even think about it, like most people. They don't think about it because they're into the distractions of life. Um, there's a theologian by the name of um, Paul Tillich. And he, he wrote extensively about uh, death. Not extensively, but quite a bit. And he, he said something. He said, um, there is something that he called the threat of non-being. The threat of non-being. Now, I want you to think about this. When you think of death, isn't it not always a third-person reaction? I mean, death, isn't that something that happens to other people? We don't think about our death. If we do, it's very fleeting. It's quick. We turn it off quick. It's very unsettling. That's what he called the threat of non-being. There is a point in time when every single one of you will not be living on this earth. Have you come to grips with that? Really? What does that do to your thinking? Oh, we don't, we don't, we'd rather just chase after the honey on the leaves. We don't like to think about that. 
the threat of non-being. And so Paul says this. He says, for, this is kind of hard to read here. As I get older, I think my eyes aren't. I don't know what that's about. I'll be happy when I get better prescription glasses. Um, for, the, for this purpose, I think it's brighter up here. Um, uh, for this uh, perishable body must put on imperishable, and the mortal body put on immortality. When the perishable puts on imperishable, and the mortal, that's not better over here, <laughs> puts on immortality, then shall come to pass what the saying is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where's your victory? Oh, death, where's your sting? You notice perishable, imperishable, mortality, immortality. What is he saying? These perishable things that we think are going to produce happiness, including our very lives, are perishable. Right, there's an expiration date on these things. How long will a movie make you happy? How about that, um, that, that uh, tomato that you stuck in your refrigerator? How long is that going to last? Everything is, is going gonna, is gonna to perish. We have an expiration date too, right? And so he says, but death, where's your victory? Where's your sting? And he goes on, and, and I love these, these verses because, because he goes on, he says, the sting of death is sin, the power of sin is the law, but thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. He died in your place. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing, and I love this part, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not vanity. It's not meaningless. We have a purpose. See, we don't just need to live a long time. You could live a long time and have a meaningless life. I, I remember, it was, I think it was a Twilight Zone. I was watching this thing a long time ago. It stuck with me. There's an astronaut, and he gets stranded out in space. But he has two vials. Maybe you saw this. He has two vials. One is... Uh, that if he drinks it, he will live forever. The other one is he drinks it, he will die. And so he's contemplating life. What's the point? There's no radio transmissions to anybody. I can't talk to anybody. I have nothing to do. That game of Scrabble, too bad I need another person. Didn't think about that. Whatever, right? He's going through all those things of meaningless life. And, and you'll get that later. And he says, I, I'm just done with this. So he quickly grabs it and he drinks it. But to his horror, guess what? He drank the wrong vial. See, eternal life without meaning and purpose it doesn't still cut it, does it? It's not just eternal life that God knows that we need, and he gave it to us if we believe in Christ, but it's something greater than that. There needs to be a meaning or a purpose to this life, and that is what the world does not get. Because in the world today, the scientists tell us that you are nothing more than matter plus time plus chance. Now, where is your purpose in that? You were made for no reason. You exist for no reason. You're just, who knows why you're here, right? I had a, a friend in seminary I hadn't seen for a while. And uh, I said, hey, how's it going, you know, Tim? And, and he says, uh, oh, things are going good. He says, you know, be careful, Dave, what you pray for. I said, well, why is that? He says, well, we've been praying for a dishwasher and my mother-in-law moved in. <laughs> but let's pretend for a second that there was a world without a dishwasher, right? There's a world without a, there's no dishwashers in our world that we live in. Imagine this for a second, okay? No dishwashers in our world. Mother-in-laws, yeah, but no dishwashers. Well, one day, Mindy, my beautiful bride, says, you know what? I'm just tired of washing these dishes by hand. I need you to do it. Now, I'm a guy. That means I don't do dishes, right? I, yeah, in horror, all these women. Anyway, yeah, a terrible guy. Um, so, so what am I going to do? I'm going to invent a dishwasher. <laughs> yeah, better use of my time, right? So I invent the first dishwasher. And now everybody can have a dishwasher. The invention was because of necessity. I am not going to do dishes, right? And so a dishwasher is invented for a purpose. See, everything in life that we have exists for a purpose. Why? Because God is a purposeful God, and he made it. So we need to know our purpose. But if you're an evolutionary, atheistic scientist, well, there's no purpose. It's just random chance. There's no reason for any of this. Well, then life is meaningless under the sun. Right? So we have to have meaning. We have to have purpose. And so we don't just need eternal life, but we need a meaningful purpose. 
And, he, and, and uh, Paul addresses that in Romans 8. He says, we know, that those, uh, we know that those who love God, all things work together for good. To those who are called or living out according to his purpose. You do have a purpose. And then, and then also he says, whatever you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. There's your purpose, to live displaying the glory of God in your life. There's your purpose. We not only have eternal life, but we have a purpose. It's to live for God. To me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Paul could say that because he understood exactly what was at, what was at risk here. And so, he says, um, and, and uh, this is actually taken in 1 Peter. What a God we have. How fortunate we are to have him. This father of our master Jesus, because Jesus was raised from the dead, we've been given a brand new life. We have everything to live for, including a future in heaven, and that future starts now. Because of what Christ did, we have everything to live for. And so we have that meaning, we have that purpose. Basil Pascal was a famous mathematician. He's a father of what they call probability theory. And famous guy, lived in the 1700s, 1600s. And uh, he died at age 38. He had been, he was a Christian, very committed, loved the Lord Christian. And he wanted to prove the existence of God to all his atheistic scientists. And so he had been working on this massive treaty, but he died before it could be published. But his friends took his work and they, call, and they, they put it, turned it into a book called The Pensee. And, um, and in it, and I want to read this so I get it right here. And in it, he talks, about, he talks about his life. He says, okay, he says this. I don't know who put me in this world, nor what the world is, nor what I myself am. I am in terrible ignorance of everything. I don't know what my body is, nor my senses, nor my soul, or even what part of me uh, thinks what, uh, what I say, which reflects upon itself as upon all external things. I have no more knowledge of them than me. I see the terrible immensity of the universe around me, and I find myself limited to one corner of this vast expanse without even knowing it. Why am I put in this place rather than another? Why do I have such a short time to live? Why is my life assigned to me at this point rather than another point? Uh, throughout the all of eternity that's come before me or that's come after me. On all sides, I see nothing but infinity, in which I am a mere atom as a shadow that endures for an instant and returns no more. All I know is that I must soon die. But what I know least of all is this very death that I cannot escape. As I know not where I come from, so I don't know where I'm going. I know not that after leaving this world, whether I will fall into nothingness or into the hands of an angry God. Without knowing of which these two states, I shall find myself forever assigned. Such is my condition, full of weakness and uncertainty. From all this, I conclude that I ought to spend every day of my life seeking to know my fate. Perhaps I might be able to find some solution to my doubts. Oh, but I can't be bothered to do so. And I will not make one step towards this discovery. He wrote that, say, this is mankind today. And he says, it is absolutely ignorant for us to live our lives pursuing these meaningless things without understanding why we're here, who is God, what is our purpose. And he says, this is the way that people live their life. They will make not one step toward figuring any of this out. And they just are content to going through the motions and, and never understanding exactly what the purpose is. Well, I want to tell you that as a Christian, we have purpose. We know why we're here. We know what our future is. We know that this world has nothing for us. Nothing wrong with the things in this world, most of them, right? But it's not the means to happiness. So let me ask you today as I close, where are you invested at? Are you invested in the things of this life thinking, I'll be happy when? I want to tell you today, this world has nothing for you. You were made for something far greater. Because Jesus Christ died on a cross and paid the price for your sins, you are not under the penalty of your sins. You are free to glorify God, to live for Christ, to see what is that great 
purpose that God has for me. I'm going to glorify God. I'm going to serve Christ until I discover what his purpose and plan is for my life. Because I tell you, it's far greater than you could ever imagine. Let's close in prayer. Our gracious Father, we thank you for this book of Ecclesiastes. Lord, the message is certainly difficult to hear because we all tend to live our lives seeking that next thing. Oh, Lord, we'll be happy when we get on vacation. We'll be happy when we can do this or buy the new car or do that. We just live for the next thing. But Lord, the next thing will never satisfy us. We see that. Solomon saw that many years ago. And so, Lord, his wisdom is timeless truth for our lives today. Lord, may it be true of us that to live is Christ, to die is gain. May we not be so easily tempted and distracted and to the indulgences of this life that do not satisfy. May we seek after that which is eternal, that we can find and understand our true meaning and purpose as we love you and follow you in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.